Okay, let's uh, start my last lecture. So this is a diagram, a flowchart of the territory that I hope to cover today. So we will see how far we get. But at the end of the last time, I was talking about different certain kinds of lattice models and how they could be written in terms of a gas of loops. Um, and and what I'm what I'm first going to show you is how those models can be mapped into the Coulomb gas, or at least a variant of the Coulomb gas, the variant of the Gaussian model that we've already talked about. I'll then show you how we can use results from that to to, to derive the Katz formula, that is to show that the scaling dimensions of these lattice models are given by the Katz formula that was obtained from a completely different point of view by looking at the null states of the Verisoro representations. I'll then completely switch gears and I'll go back to the random curve description of the lattice model and I'll give you uh, what will probably be a rather fast review of the mathematical description of these random curves uh, using what's called SLE. Um, and then at the end, I will link SLE to the, to the Coulomb gas. So hopefully we're going to, 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 okay, so let me remind you of where we were. Um, we, we were talking about models that could be, that could be, Described by random closed curves on the hexagonal lattice. So here, for example, is a closed curve. And each closed curve came in with a weight lambda, which was the largest eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix of the graph on which this lattice model is based. And, and in fact, for the rest of the lecture, I'm going to assume that the graph is what we call AM, which looks like just a chain of M sites dot, 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 connected like this. So that's the graph HM. So if you label the sites one, two, three, up to M, that means that the things that I was calling the heights, h, h of r, take the values 1 up to m. So you can think of them, that's why, that's why we can possibly call them heights. So, so each, each, um, each loop was weighted with a weight lambda, and also we had a factor, so the partition function was the sum over all, all, over all loop configurations, lambda to the number of loops, and then this x to the total length. And I argued that there was a critical value of x at which the mean length of the loops diverges. I'm, I'm going to call that x critical, and I'm always going to assume from now on that I'm going to be at the critical point, so we get a conformal field theory in the end. So uh, what I also said was that each 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 loop which carries a weight lambda, I can think of it as a sum over two possible orientations. Um, and I'm going to give this, this orientation a weight e to the i chi, this one e to the minus i chi, 
so that lambda was equal to 2 cosine chi. Now, if you do the calculation of the largest eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix for this AM graph, what you actually find here is that lambda is 2 cosine pi over m plus 1. So I can identify this thing with chi here. Okay. So that's going to be my, my weight for the oriented loops. And, and the whole point about that was that um, if, for example, I have an oriented loop here, I can write that factor e to the i chi in terms of local factors. That is, every time I turn to, to, every time I turn to the left, I have a factor e to the i e to the i chi over six. And every time I turn to the right, I have a factor e to the minus i chi over 6. So, so now I've written this back in terms of, of local weights, but they're complex. Any questions? Because that was as far as I got last time. Okay. Now we are going to rewrite this oriented loop, loop, loop model. So let me schematically draw a picture of the oriented loops. So here's one orientation, here's another, there's another. Uh, this one goes suppose that way, suppose that way. Okay, and here's our system. We are now going to write this oriented loop model into, back in terms of a model on the triangular lattice. So let's go back to the triangular lattice. And I'm going to introduce a different set of heights. Let, let me call them H tilde. Equals heights on the triangle on the triangular lattice. But these heights, instead of living on the graph AM, are going to be integers, or in fact, multiples of integers. So for some reason, historically, we, we, we take them to be multiples of, of pi. Um, it's always useful to be consistent with the literature, so that's what I'm trying to do. So, so these heights can be 0 pi, 2 pi, minus pi, minus 2 pi, dot, 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 dot. Okay. So they're not restricted to, to having a finite range of, 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 of values. And I'm going to identify each loop configuration, each oriented loop configuration um, with a particular configuration of these heights, H tilde, on the triangular pattern. And, and the rule is going to be, uh, when I want to look at the difference between the heights here and here, then if I cross an arrow going that way, the height goes up. If I cross an arrow going Going, oops, this is going the wrong way. If I cross an arrow going that way, then the height goes 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 down. So, so I'm standing here. I look at the at the site that I'm going to. First of all, 
if I don't cross a loop at all, the height stays the same. If the loop goes this way, then the height goes up one, maybe, and if it goes that way, it goes down one. So if, for example here, I take all the heights h tilde to be zero on the boundary, and I have a configuration like, like, like this, then when I go from here to here, then, then, then I cross an arrow going this way, so the height is going to be plus pi. If I cross an arrow going this way, here is going to be minus pi. This one is going to be minus pi. This one, because it's going down, is going to be zero. This one's going to be plus pi, and so on, okay? So I hope it's clear that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the configurations of oriented loops and values of these heights on the triangular lattice. Okay, so there's a one-to-one -one mapping between oriented loops oriented loops and, and the values of H tilde R on the triangular lattice with the restriction that the change in H tilde between nearest neighbor sites on the triangular lattice is either zero, well, the change is either zero or plus or minus pi, okay? So, so what I've, what I've basically t done now is converted my original lattice model where the heights lived on this graph AM to another model where the heights H tilde just live on the all, all the integers times pi, but the weights are complex. Nevertheless, now the weights are local and they only depend on, so the important thing is that the weights are local and they depend only on the differences of H. On the delta H's. That is, if I shift all the heights by a constant, then I just make a change in the boundary conditions, but I don't change the configuration of loops, so I don't change the weights. So the weights have this invariance under, sorry, this is H tilde, under H tilde goes to H tilde plus pi, plus pi times any integer. So now what I'm going to do is to make a big step. So up to now, everything's just been counting. It's been completely rigorous, but now comes the, the, the egg step, which is that under renormalization, under some kind of RG flow, this is going to map into some kind of a conformal field theory, which a conformal field theory which depends upon the field H tilde, which is now going to be a continuous live in, in, in continuous space such that it's invariant under, under H tilde goes to H tilde plus N pi. So, so, so now, now the claim is that the best or perhaps the only candidate for this is a Gaussian model. Well, it's almost a Gaussian model. So the action is going to be the action that we've written down all the time, integral 
Brad H. Tilda PE2R. That's the action of, of a Gaussian model. This is invariant under adding any uniform constant to, to H tilde. But in fact, H is only invariant under, under discrete shifts by, by pi. So I'm going to add to this a term lambda cosine 2 tilde H B2R. So as lambda goes to infinity, H tilde evaporates. So I think I want to have a minus sign here. As lambda goes to plus infinity, we want to make the cosine 2 H tilde as large as possible equal to 1. That's going to quantize H tilde in units of pi. So H tilde belongs to integer times pi, but as lambda goes to zero, we get the usual Gaussian model with, with no extra term. Okay. So what I'm now going to do is to examine the mapping to this model and neglect this term for the time being and then make the argument or use as a condition the fact that it doesn't really matter whether I put this term in or not. So I'm going to assume that taking lambda equals zero is the same as lambda, as the same as infinite lambda, but then I'm going to use that as a condition. Okay, so we are therefore going to assert that under renormalization, all this chain of mappings of, of models maps to the Gaussian model. But this can't be quite true. It must be wrong in some kind of, 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 of and because we know that the Gaussian model has, has central charge one, and, and what we're hoping is that these correspond to models given by the Cass formula with the central charge less than one. So this would give the wrong value of C. So what do we do? How do we possibly get the, the, the correct value of C? Well, one way to measure C, as I told you, was to look on a cylinder and to look at a cylinder of circumference L and large length, small L, much, much bigger than L, and to say that the partition function goes like e to the pi C over 6 big L times small L. So let's look at this model now on the on the cylinder. Then actually something goes wrong in this argument here. As long as we have loops which are like this on the, the, the cylinder, it's still true that the number of left turns minus, minus the number of right turns is equal to six. So this this, so, so that we can write lambda in terms of these, these local weights. But if we look at loops that wrap around the cylinder, like this, or like this, then obviously, as we go around, this is a closed loop. We still want it to have weight lambda, but the number of left turns is going to equal the number of right turns. So if we use the same local weights, uh, these e to the i chi over sixes, we're going to get that the loops going around the cylinder are going to be counted with a weight two and not a weight lambda. So that's wrong. So we are actually going to get a weight two here rather than when we, when we add this to this, well, 
this is going to have weight one, this is going to have weight one. When we add these two, we're, we are going to get a weight two rather than a weight lambda. So we, we have to work out a way of compensating for, for this. And the way we can compensate for this is um, let's suppose we have a configuration like this. Then let's suppose the weight here is zero. Then we go up. The weight here is pi. The weight here is. <laughs> let's suppose we go up again. So here the weight is two pi. So we would like this to have a weight um, e to the 2i chi, right? E to, e to the 2i chi. So if the difference, here you notice that the difference in h between here and here is 2 pi. And we want to give this, 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 this configuration a weight um, e to the e to the e to the two i chi. So actually, let's suppose this is minus pi and this is zero and this is pi. That that, that, that makes more sense. So we 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 can actually actually do this by by inserting by splitting up this factor into into e to the e to the two e to the i e to the minus i chi times minus pi here and e to the plus chi times plus I, e to the plus i chi times plus pi here. Okay, so if we insert these, if we split up this 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 factor, so it's this one here, and so we get e to the minus i chi times minus pi here, e to the i chi times plus pi here. Then we're going to then we're going to realize the factor that we want to actually have. So you notice that this factor here is precisely the weight h at minus infinity. It's, it's, so this, is, uh, this is minus l over 2 plus l over 2. h of minus l over 2. This factor is h of plus l over 2. So now I'm going to generalize generalize this argument and 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 say that if I have any configuration of loops going across, either going up or down or up or down, okay, then there are certain heights here between here and here and here and here. If I look at the value of the height here, which is h of minus l over 2, and I put in a factor e to the minus i chi h of minus l over 2 here, and I put in a factor e to the plus i chi of h of minus l plus l over 2 here, then, then whatever the configuration is here, what I'm going to get is e to the i chi times the difference in h between here and here, which is equal to, apart from a factor pi, is equal to the number of up arrows minus the number of down arrows. So it's going to give me the correct factor. Okay, so I can compensate for the fact that, that the loops going around the cylinder aren't counted right by inserting these electric operators at the ends of the cylinder. Okay. So actually, 
the partition function for the uh, that I'm actually interested in is going to be the partition function for the Gaussian model times the expectation value of e to the minus i chi h of minus l h tilde. These are all h tilde, but that doesn't matter. e to the i chi of h of l over 2 on this cylinder. Okay. And this is evaluated also in the Gaussian model. So we know how to we know how to actually do that. The Gaussian G is going to the Gaussian C G is going to go like this with C equals one. So e to the pi C L over six L. And then we get e to the minus two pi over L over L times X of Q and this particular Q is corresponds to having a charge Q equals chi. So we know that that therefore when we so so this is with C equals 1. We know that x, x of q was this q squared over, over, over 2g. So we can, we can write this as e to the pi cl over 6l. And the result is that the effective value of, of of C, the one that we get in here, is actually changed away from this, and what we find is that this is C over 6 becomes 1 over 6 minus pi over pi squared 1 over G. So I think Q is equal to chi over pi. Okay, so that's how, although this model looks locally like, like a Gaussian model, globally it's not. And, of course, if we're at a critical point, then the boundary conditions or how we put it on a cylinder or a torus or whatever is important. So this is how we can get a value of C which is smaller than 1. So there is a relation, therefore, between C and G and chi, but I haven't yet told you what G is. But before I tell you what G is, let, 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 let me just tell you how the scaling dimensions also get, get, get changed. Because if we want to now put in e to the i q h here and an e to the minus i q h here. So if we want to work out what is the scaling dimension of e to the i q h, so, so what is the correlation function of e to the i q h of minus l over 2 e to the minus i q h of h of plus l over to in the model, then what we have to do is to work out the correlator of e to the i q minus chi over pi of h of minus l over to e to the minus i q of minus chi over pi of h of plus l over 2 in the, in, in the Coulomb gas, but we should divide it by the partition function, which is e to the i q 
h of minus l over 2 e to the minus i cubed of h plus l over 2 in the Coulomb gas. So all I'm saying is that in order to make this shift in C, we have to insert these extra charges at the end of the cylinder. Now, if we want to measure a correlation function by adding additional charges, Q, then, we, then it's as though we have a charge uh, Q minus chi here and Q, and Q, Q minus chi here. So we, so we ask, how does this decay? X of Q, let me call it X of Q tilde now, e to the minus 2 pi L over L. So, so we, we then get a formula for how the scaling dimensions are, are shifted in this model. That X Q tilde is, is equal to 1 over 2 pi Q minus chi over pi squared, which is comes from the numerator, and then we have to subtract off what it would be at q equals zero, which is the partition function, which is this formula here. Okay, sorry, this is g. So, so the the conclusion is that the scaling dimensions in the model that we started with, way over here, by this mapping to the Coulomb gas, are given are going to be given by a formula rather like this on at the far end of the blackboard. And this is starting to look a little bit like the CAT formula, but we're not quite there yet. And the reason that we're not quite there yet is that we have to address this thing here. Okay. Why was it, why when we're interested in lambda equals infinity, was it justified to, to set lambda equals zero? Well, that could only be the case if in the renormalization group sense, this coupling constant was what's called marginal. Because if the, if the values of the central charge and, and the exponents don't depend upon lambda, then it must not flow under the renormalization group. So it doesn't matter whether we take lambda equals zero or, or one or, or infinity. So if this thing is marginal, that means it's dimensionless. And because here we have dimension two, this means that this, this, this object here, which is, which is like e to the two i h tilde plus e to the minus two i h tilde, has to have scaling dimension x tilde, x tilde 2, right? Because here q, q is 2, so x tilde of 2 should be 2. So if we use this formula here, and insist now that x tilde of 2 equals 2, this gives us a relation between G and chi. And, and that's the last thing that we actually have to fix. Yes, this is the sine Gordon action. Very good. Lambda is marginal, yeah. So in the sine Gordon theory, yes. In the sine Gordon theory, C equals one, okay. But we are looking at a modified sine Gordon theory with these extra charges at the end of the cylinder. And we have to use the, the shifted value of the exponent here and set that equal 
0.22. So we are looking at something that formally looks like the 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 the, the Klein Gordon theory, except we've got these extra charges around. So it's they modify the they modify the theory in an essential way. And they change the value of C and they change the value of the scaling dimensions. So if you put X tilde of two equals two, that gives you a relation between um, it, it, between G and, and, and chi, and what's going is that G is one minus chi of pi. So you can, you can eliminate chi for, for one minus G in this formula, and if you do that, you will get something which essentially gives you the Katz formula. Okay, so I went through that rather, rather fast, and I must say, this argument that I presented to you has now been around for 20 years, 25 years, and nobody has done any better. I don't like it. I know you don't like it. You're, you're very, very quiet, and you don't like it. You don't like it, do you? Okay, I don't like it either. But it's the best argument that we have, okay? And, and if one of you wants to improve this argument and to really show that, uh, that you can make this Coulomb gas work properly, that would be a great, a great contribution to the, 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 the whole field. But right now, it's at this level of, well, Things work, but it's a little bit mysterious why they work, okay? So I don't want to give you the impression that everything is, is cut and dried here, okay, because it's not. Okay. Okay, so I'm I'm here and now I'm I'm going to start describing something which but by contrast, is is actually mathematically rigorous. Okay, so but I won't go into proving anything. But I'll give you a, a actually it stands for Schramm, Lovner evolution, and. I want, I, I, I will, as I go on, I will describe to you what were the contributions of Lovner and Schramm here. But the thing that I want to stress is this word evolution. That involves time dependence. And what we're actually going to do, even though we're describing equilibrium stat mech here, we are going to introduce an artificial time into, into the, the, the game. So. In the end, everything's going to be described in terms of random walks and Brownian motions and everything that you learned about in the other courses, okay? So, let's suppose we have uh, one of these loop models in some region here. So, what we would like to do uh, here's a typical configuration of loops. Gas of loops. We would like to, to describe what is the probability distribution or the measure on these loops. Now, that looks like a terribly difficult problem. So, the way that the, <laughs> the way we, the way we, look at it is to not focus on all the loops at once, but just to focus on one curve. And we can do that by, for example, taking one of these height models, where 
where the heights go from one up to n. And choosing boundary conditions here, such that, that, that the heights all the way around here are at height h, and the heights all the way around this part of the boundary are called h, are h plus one. So all the, all the heights on this part of, of the boundary are fixed to, to a particular value h here. All the ones on this part of the boundary are fixed to a particular one, h plus one. Then we know that there has to be a domain wall between these two points here. Such that just to the left of here, the heights are h, and just to the right, they're h plus one. Okay. And what we're going to do, or what SLE does, is it tells you something about the probability distribution of these curves here, just a single curve. Once you've understood that, then you can go ahead and understand loops. But you can answer all kinds of interesting questions, in fact, just by looking at the statistics of a, of a single curve. So this is called a chordal curve because it's like a chord connecting two points on a, on a boundary. So this is called a chordal curve. Now, one thing that you can say immediately is if this whole thing is going to be conformally invariant, then we're free to choose this domain, this simply connected domain here to be anything that, that we want. So we're actually going to look at things in the upper half plane. So here's the, here's the real axis, here's the origin. We are going to fix, uh, let, let me actually start drawing a bit of a, a bit of the lattice here. We've got this honeycomb lattice here. Try to try to draw this. A bit of it anyway. And so on. Okay, so so on the triangular lattice, which is which is uh, here somewhere. So here are the sites of the triangular lattice, um, and we are going to have a boundary condition that all the heights here are going to be h, 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 h all the way along, and h plus one, h plus one. One. And then we know that there is going to be a domain wall which is going to start here somewhere, okay? And it must go off to infinity because it can't come back to the real axis again, either here or here, because h is constant here and h is constant here. So, that, so, that, so there must be a single curve which actually starts here and ends at, in, at in infinity. So what we want to do is to understand what are the statistics of this of, of, of this curve. And it's important to realize that we can actually construct these curves by what's called an exploration process. So, so there are two ways that I could draw, uh, that I could sample the probability distribution on, on these curves. One is that I could do a Monte Carlo of the model in the entire upper half plane. I do updates on, on, on the heights according to some metropolis 
algorithm, and then for each configuration of the heights, which are on the triangular lattice, I draw this curve. That's one way I could do it. But another way is I could look at it sequentially, right? So, so, so I know the curve has, has to start here, and then at the next step, it either has to go to the left or the right. What is the relative probability of it going to the left or the right? Well, given the values of the heights along here, there's a certain probability uh, that this height is h plus 1. If it's h plus 1, the curve goes to the left. If it's h, it goes to goes the right. So I could imagine running uh, some kind of a some kind of an algorithm where I work out what is the whether what is the probability of it turning of it turning left or right. Let's suppose it turns left. Then I know this height here is then h plus one. And then at the next stage, it either turns left or it turns right. Okay, now it's a bit more, more complicated, but whether it turns left or, or right depends on the value of, on, on the probability that this one is equal to h or e equal to h plus one. So what I can do, or what I can imagine doing, is running a Monte Carlo I compute the average value of this height, given that that I've already grown the curve to there. That is, given that the heights along here are all h, the heights along here are h plus 1, and also given that this one is h plus 1. And that probability is going to depend on the fact that this is h plus 1. So I work out, I can imagine, it would be very hard to do, but I can imagine working out that probability and, and then depending on, 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 on that, I either turn left or right. So I can imagine keeping on doing, do, do, I can imagine keep, uh, keeping on doing that, and this is what's called the exploration process. So this is a way of sort of growing the curve in time, a dynamical way of growing the, the, the curve, which is guaranteed to reproduce the correct probability distribution for the curve once I let it run all the way to infinity. Well, I have to do a calculation, right? I actually, I mean, this is impossible, actually, but, but at, 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 at this stage, let's suppose this were just an icing model, so the highest were plus one and minus one. Then what, what I would have to do, given that all the spins here are minus one, given that they're all plus one here, given that the spin here is plus one, work out what is the expectation value of the magnetization here which is not going to be zero. Okay. And based on that, I work out the probability that this thing is minus one or plus one, and that tells me whether, whether that curve turns right, right or left. Okay. Yeah, oh yes, everything is just going to depend on the Boltzmann waves in my... model. So when I do this, I'm going to get some, some random curve and you can, you, you, you can actually see that it never intersects itself because once it gets here, for example, it has to go that way, for example. And it never gets trapped either because it has to end 
ad infinitum. Okay, so that's the that's the exploration process on the lattice. So now SLE, or rather Lovner evolution, is the is the continuous version of this. Lovner evolution is, is a way of describing curves that grow into a region. This goes back to 1923. So this is a subject in the mathematical theory of informal mappings. So now we're not on a lattice anymore. We're in the continuum. Here's the origin. Here's the half a half plane. And let's suppose we have a curve and I'm going to assume that it's a simple curve, at least for the time being. A simple curve is one that doesn't intersect itself. And I'm, I'm going to call it gamma of t. And t is a time during which I'm, 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 I'm growing the, the curves. So this could be gamma of t, and I could grow it for a bit longer. This is gamma of t prime. And, 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 and so on. So what I would like, first of all, to, to have is a way of describing this, 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 So one way to, to, to do it is to think about the region outside this curve. So the region which has a boundary, which is the positive real axis, the right-hand side of the curve, the left-hand side of the curve, and the negative real axis. Okay, That, which I can call H minus gamma of t. H stands for the upper half plane. Okay. This, this region is also a simply connected region. And according to Riemann, there is something called the Riemann, the Riemann mapping theorem that says that I can conformally map any simply connected region into any other simply connected region by an analytic function. So, so there is therefore, therefore going to be a conformal mapping of the upper half plane minus, 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 the, minus the curve by some mapping that I'm going to call GT of Z. So this is the Z plane. And, and what what that is going to do is that it's going to map the whole of this red thing here into this, into the real axis. So, so I'll describe this a bit more. It turns out that the Riemann mapping theorem also says that, that that this particular analytic function gt of z, which which actually does this, is not unique. But we can make it unique by saying what happens at infinity. So as 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 z goes to infinity when we're a long way away from the growing growing tip. 
we're going to demand that this function goes like C. That is, we're not doing anything adding energy. Then we can make a Laurent expansion. There is, there is, there, there is a term of order one that just corresponds to an overall left and right shift, I'm going to choose this to be zero, and then there's a term of order one over z, and then a term of one over z squared, etc. Now, this term of one over z is something that you can prove increases as the curve grows. Now, if you actually do a little bit of electrostatics, you know that you can use conformal mappings to solve problems in electrostatics. So if you, if you imagine looking at the reflection of this curve here, I'll try to do that in the real axis. And if you put a unit charge, imagine this curve is a conductor, but it's broken here, and this curve is also a conductor. If you put a unit charge on this part of the curve, then put a, the, the opposite charge on this part here, so that the real axis is going to be at zero potential, because this is the reflection here. Then at large distances a long way away, this has zero net charge, but it has a dipole moment electric dipole moment. The coefficient of 1 over z here is precisely the electric dipole moment. And if you think about how you use conformal mappings to solve problems in electrostatics, basically the real part of this function is the electrostatic potential and the 1 over z term is the electric dipole moment here. So all I mean, all I'm saying just to use this analogy is as the curve grows, the electric dipole moment always increases. So what you can prove is as the curve grows, this coefficient always increases. Now I haven't told you what t was. I mean, Originally here, you might have thought that the time was the length of, 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 of a curve. But that doesn't make sense in the continuum because actually, I haven't, I haven't really told you that, but actually at the critical point in the scaling limit, these boundary, these domain wall boundaries are fractal objects. They're fractals, so they don't have a well-defined length anyway. So we can't use the length of the curve anyway. So as this number is is increasing with 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 t, and because the time here is completely artificial anyway, it is it is just something that we increase then we might as well define this to be t. And conventionally, we actually call it 2t. So having chosen this to be 0 and having chosen this to be 2t, given gamma, what you can show is that there's a unique conformal mapping of H minus gamma into H. So now this, this makes G, T, and Z unique. Now, so, so I told you um, that, that this is going to map this red curve here into the, into into the real axis, but in particular, if we look at the, at the growing tip here, which is a tau of t, 
this is going to get mapped into a particular point on the real axis that we're going to call A of T. So A of T is G of T tau of T. The image of the growing tip under 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 this formal mapping. And the whole part of the positive real axis on the right hand side of the curve is going to get get mapped into the real axis to the right of A of T. And this part will get mapped into the real axis to the left of T. Any questions so far? Now comes the magic. Hey, cause what? Hey, cause what? Obviously, what we'd like to do is to write an equation of motion for the, for the, for how this 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 curve grows. But I told you it's a fractal. I mean, how do we write an equation, a continuous equation of motion for how a fractal grows? Well, although the curve is, is going to grow in a very erratic way, if we look at a point C, which is not on the curve, then in fact it changes smoothly as a function of T. So we can actually write a, an equation for it, which is called the Loebner equation. Just an ordinary differential equation for this G of T. So it's true pointwise in C. So for each value of 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 C. Of C This, this, this equation, and it's actually true for every point C which is not on the curve. Not on camera T. Okay, so uh, I'd like to give you just a quick idea where this, where this thing, where this equation comes from, let's just look at one particular example. Let's look at the case of a curve which is just going straight up. So it's starting at the origin and it's just going straight up. So we want to make a conformal mapping of this region here into the, into the upper half plane. Well, that's actually a standard problem, actually, in, in electrostatics. We, we actually have a conductor here, and we have a straight stick, and we place a charge on it. How do we compute the electrostatic potential? So I'm just going to write down the answer here, Gtz is equal to z squared plus 40 to the square root. So this point here is 2i square root of t, and the image is here. So it actually has a branch point here at the end of the curve at when this thing vanishes. But I've chosen these, these, these numbers such that the asymptotic behavior is what it is here. Okay, so that's how how it works when we have a, a straight stick. Now what I'm going to do is to write down an equation for how g of t changes under a slight change in, in t. So let me just write it down and explain it later. So, 
well, basically, I'm trying to do now is, is I have the curve gamma sub t, and I grow it again, and then I have gamma sub t plus plus t plus alpha delta delta t. Then I look at the image of this under gt, then the first part of the curve gets mapped to the real, to the, this part of the curve gets mapped to the real, real axis. This tip here gets mapped into at, and this little bit gets mapped into a little straight, straight stick growing up for a time delta, 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 t. So actually, this equation is just expressing the fact that g of t plus delta t is the composition of this map, but started at 8 a t rather than the origin, with the map g t. Okay, so this, this, so, so, this G G zero is basically saying the G of T plus delta T is 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 the composition of G zero with G of T. Except I have to shift G of I have to shift the value of C here to whichever point A T. So that's roughly how it works. And now, if you take, if you differentiate, if you work out the term of all the delta, 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 delta t here, you will see this is g t of t plus two delta t of delta t plus delta t squared. So that is the physicist version of the Bertman equation. Any questions? Okay, so moving right on here. I'm going to get there. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay, very, very important point. Okay, well, we have done something amazing here, right? By this equation, so a of t is going to move as the, as as the curve grows. A of t is a continuous function. A of t is going to move continuously on the real axis. So that's that's an important point. So as Gamma of t grows, as long as gamma of t grows continuously, then A of t moves continuously. So what we've done, or what Lerner was able to do, is to show, is to map the problem of, of curves growing into the upper half plane to classifying continuous functions on the real line, okay? So what you can show is that um, if, you, if you know the curve, then you know gt of z in principle. It may be very hard to write down, but in principle. Therefore, you know how it changes. Therefore, you know a of t, or rather, you know where the tip gets mapped, so you know A of T. So for every curve, there's going to be a unique A of T. Conversely, by integrating the Lerner equation, for every A of T, we get a sequence of G of Ts, and that tells us the curve. Okay. So then the question is, what about the curves in these models? What is A A? of t then. Okay. So these are going to be random curves. So in these models, these are going to be random curves. So a of t is going to be a random function. 
there's going to be some kind of stochastic process on the real line. Now, everybody knows what the simplest one is, but that's the punchline, okay? So, so the punchline was was due to was due to our dead shrum in about uh, 2000 or so. Who said that if, and I'll, I'll sort of state it in a slightly mathematical way, if the measure on gamma, uh, gamma of t is conformally invariant, we need to define what that means. If it's conformally invariant, then a of t is a 1D Brownian motion. So this was Schramm's theorem. So let me try to give you an indication of why that might be true. So, once again, what we imagine doing is growing the curve for a time t and, 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 and getting the curve gamma of t, then growing it for a further time t minus t prime so that, so that then the whole curve is gamma of And then imagine making the mapping of this under G of G. So what we're going to get then is this thing starts at the origin, but now it's going to now the this part of the curve is going to go into into, into the, the real axis, and this this part is going to go into 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 some other curve which is which is gt of of this little tail here which is gamma of t prime minus gamma t set minus gamma t so this is just the image of the remaining part of 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 the curve under the conformal mapping So, the, the argument's much easier to actually say in words than it is to write down. So, I'm going to say the words slowly, okay? Um, if we had a measure or a probability distribution on the initial set of curves, gamma of t, then under this conformal mapping, this is going to induce a probability distribution on, on this image curve. It doesn't have to be the same, right? So if we have a probability S distribution here, this G of T depends upon gamma of T, but it doesn't depend on, on the rest. So given the first part, there is still some conditional probability distribution on the rest here. That is going to induce under this conformal mapping a probability distribution on the image. Okay, that's always going to be true. However, if it's conformally invariant, if the probability distribution on on the image is the same as what we would have gotten if 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 we had just shifted this back to the origin and started again all over again. Then we say this probability distribution is conformally invariant. Okay, so if the probability distribution on the image is the same as what we started with, we can say that the measure on, on this whole set of curves is conformally invariant. That's what this thing means here. So 
what you can also show, though, is that this, this, uh, the, the actual Lerner time for which this curve involves is now t prime minus minus t minus t. So, what has to happen? basically implies is that the is that the is that the is that the probability distribution of a t minus of a of t prime minus minus a of t that the distribution is the same is, is is first of all is is the same as what we would have had of a t minus a of t minus t prime so a better way of putting it is that a of t of a's Law of law of independent increments. That is, if I consider a of t and then a of two t and then a of a of a of three t, a of four t, then then a of n plus one t. Minus a of n t. These are independent random variables, independent identically distributed iid random variables. And, and this has to be true for all t. So it's like we we. So if so, it's like we have a random random random. Walk. If the time interval were 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 t, then then the probability of going to the left or the right is independent of where we are. But 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 it's like a random walk where the step size, where it's a random walk for all possible values of the. And that means that it has to be a brown immersion. So this particular argument, I haven't uh, explained it very well. I hope if you look at my review here, I hope I explain it slightly better there. Or you could go back to the original literature where it's explained in mathematical language. But it's basically the fact that if the distribution of these curves is conformally invariant, of course, mathematically, you still have to prove that. There is still a huge step from these lattice models proving that the distribution of these curves is conformally invariant. But if it is conformally invariant in this sense of, that I tried to, to describe here, then the driving term in the Loebner equation has to be a one-dimensional Brownian motion along the axis. So basically what is actually happening is the following. So it's very simple actually. So we actually have this, this one dimensional one di one one dimensional motion here. Um, so if this is time and this is A of T, it's basically doing a one dimensional 
continuous form of a one-dimensional random ran, ran, random wall. What is happening to the curve as we grow it at, as, at, the, at, at, at the same time is when the curve is moving to the right, the curve is, move, is turning to the right. When it's moving to the left, it's turning to the to, to the left. But it's doing so in a conformally invariant way. So in a scale in 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 invariant way. So so it's not true that the amplitude of these oscillations is is related to how far the curve gets in the plane. It's more complicated than that. In, in, in fact, um, in fact, if I get there, I'll explain it. Um, so this is doing a one-dimensional random walk. The only thing that we don't know is what is the, what is the diffusion constant. So if we take the average of a squared t or of a t squared, this is going to go proportional to t, but there's going to be some diffusion constant here, which we call k kappa. And the only parameter of this theory is kappa. So the claim is that different values of the lattice models that we started with are going to have different values of kappa, just in the same way that they have different values of c and G. So actually, really, her last step is to understand a little bit about this, these things. Obviously, as kappa increases, as kappa increases, the curve gets more windy. Not windy, but windy. Okay. It winds more. So how can we express that? So it turns out that if you look at the distribution of the winding angle, so we have to, we have to somehow define that. So it's not very easy to do this in the context of the upper half plane. But if instead we look at a cylinder, and a semi-infinite cylinder, so now what I've done is that I've mapped the upper half plane into this semi-infinite cylinder such that the boundary so, such that the real axis is mapped to this end of the cylinder and infinity is been mapped here somewhere. Okay, then we can actually, some point in the half plane has been mapped here somewhere. Then we can consider curves which are growing here. So they're, so they're winding around, but they're growing along the And they can wrap around it. They can wrap around it more than once. Okay. And 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 so one thing that you can ask is how many times, or what's the distribution of the angle theta that they wind around with? Okay. Now, I'm not going to write an equation down. You can see that if different and I'm interested in the case where this length of the cylinder is much larger than the circumference here. Then in that case, if I have a very, very long cylinder, yes, and it's winding around and around, and I break it into pieces which are much larger than big L here, they should be statistically independent. Okay. So you you would you would actually guess that, that this winding angle 
is like a random walk itself. And it has a Gaussian test dis dis distribution. So that the winding angle as a function of L squared should grow proportional to L. Okay. But what's causing this is this, this thing here doing a random walk here. If we started from a slightly different, different, different value, the whole thing would rotate. So it's the random motion of this A of T here, which is doing a random walk here, which is actually causing the winding here. So you might guess, and it's actually true, that, that the distribution of the winding angle is proportional to kappa, and I think I get it right. Okay, so the interpretation of kappa in this geometry is extremely direct. Now, if you want to understand now what is the relation of kappa to everything else I've been talking about, like in the Coulomb, in the, in the Coulomb gas, looking at this connection here, we have to do the same calculation within the, within the, gas. So in the Coulomb gas, what's going to happen? Let me just, 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 just assume that the, that the length is small and there isn't very much winding. Then I'm going to start with a height here, which is say zero. And on average, because every time I cross the curve, the height goes up or down by pi, then, then, then the average height here is going to be equal to theta over two pi um, times pi. Okay. So, 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 in terms of the Coulomb gas, which has actually g. D2R, what we're doing is that we're putting a, a slow twist in this H field, and we can easily estimate what the energy of that is. Okay, it's like twisting the field, it's like twisting the angle in the XY model. So what what, what this winding angle does is to measure the value of g, which in XY language is called the spin wave stiffness. So the, what, what we then find in the Coulomb gas is that once again, this thing has a, a Gaussian test distribution, um, but the coefficient is for energy is inversely proportional to its difference. So we see that kappa is for over g. So that means, for example, because I told you that, that g was 4 over 3 for the icing model, So kappa equals three. So the curves in the in 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 the icing model are conjecturally described by SLE with kappa equals three, and so on. So uh, there's a lot more that I could say here. There's a huge. Once you have this sort of stochastic, once, once you manage to map the properties of these curves onto Brownian motion, you can ask 
lots of questions about this curve, these about the statistics of 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 of, of these curves. For example, you you can ask what is their fractal dimension? Uh, that can be cast into a question about Brownian motion. You can ask, and the answer is that the fractal dimension is one plus kappa over A. So they become more and more fractal as you increase kappa. You can ask questions that you would never think about asking before, like as the curve grows into the upper half plane, and I have a point R here, what's the probability that gamma goes to the left of R? Okay. By reducing this to a problem in, in a random walk here, it's just the probability that a random walk does a certain thing, and that's easy to work out. Um, what else? Okay, so uh, um, if you read my review, you can see a couple of examples of this kind of calculation, um, and uh, I hope that that half, very quick half hour introduction has whetted your appetite. So it's been very uh, enjoyable giving these lectures. It's, it has enabled me to actually organize these subjects a little bit again in my mind. I'm sorry that it's perhaps been a little bit more technical than the rest of the talks or different from the rest of the talks anyway, but I hope you enjoyed it. I won't be giving a tutorial today because I'm leaving. So um, if you have any questions for me, you'll either have to grab me now or, or, or after lunch. But, uh, but please do ask me if you have any.